Okay. So at this point we can uh, start uh, opening this uh, new new topic, and uh, the goal here is uh, to start uh, uh, analyzing the different uh, technologies uh, that you may use uh, in uh, in a smart environment. Um, at this point, let's say the the, the, the course. Uh, somewhat forks into parallel uh, streams. On one side, uh, you are uh, investing a lot of energies in the, in the, in the uh, group works, uh, to finish your uh, group works. And, and so most of the, say, lectures in class uh, that uh, uh, you need for the uh, group work have, have already been done. They have been put in the, in the first part of the course. In the last month, uh, we are using these hours here in the class uh, mainly not exclusively, but because next week will be a project review, but mainly uh, for uh, getting an overview of the technology that you use. Some wider overview than you got uh, about the devices that are actually usable in the lab. So up to now, we gave you the minimal information to be able to work in the lab. And now we start uh, backing up a bit uh, and uh, having a wider angle uh, about uh, what is available to help you know better and make more choices, informed choices when you're doing some, some design or some project or, or whatever. Okay, and uh, uh, of course the, the starting point is always this picture. And this picture always tells us that, okay, if you want to do an overview about uh, and having a minimum knowledge about uh, what technologies are available in the smart home and smart building systems, uh, you will have a long list of different technologies, each of them different from the others with their specificity, with their protocol, with their ways of modeling devices and on, on doing comments and so on. Up to now, we try to, to shield from you this complexity, thanks to the middleware, thanks to the gateway, but if we want to uh, have a look at this, uh, we will have, it would take uh, actually too much time and too much detail that we are willing to put into this course or available to, or, or able to, to put into this course. And so uh, we thought of doing this in a slightly different way. Uh, so actually this complexity can be handled in two ways and the uh, option one is what most uh, companies do. If you check one company that could be an integration company or, uh, or design company or startups or, or whatever, they usually choose one technology and go with that. This choice may be more or less uh, say, uh, successful, uh, they could select the good one or, or, or not, but uh, they specialize in one specific technology. Of course, we don't want to go this way. And uh, uh, the other option is trying to handle in a uniform way from a higher level point of view, all or most uh, the available technology. So instead of developing a language, a framework in which uh, we will be able to look at different technologies and say, okay, you are similar to that in this respect, uh, and, uh, but you are differing from these uh, other points, these other features, these other issues. Mm -hmm. So having some sort of a interpretation framework in which we can, uh, let's say, uh, evaluate also the different technologies. Mm -hmm. um, finding that some technologies are very similar to each other and uh, being able to point out what is common and what is different from two different uh, technologies that we have to choose between, and uh, uh, also try to train ourselves not to be trapped into the specific terminology of the different technologies. So we will recognize that different technologies maybe do the same thing, but they call it, or same or very similar things, but they call it in different ways. Uh, because of their specificity, their nature, or how they evolved for historical reasons, uh, or, or just for being different, uh, or just for looking more incompatible than they are actually uh, from the others. 
So if you compare them from the bottom up, if you take the specifications of different uh, technologies, you will find nothing in common. But if you start uh, uh, looking at them from the top down, maybe you can find something. So uh, w the last point, we already, we, you already experienced that. Uh, no? For example, through the gateways, you, you look at devices, you just care about which comments uh, they can receive. And maybe the devices from different brands uh, using different technologies can be modeled, can be seen as implementing the same comments or very similar comments. So this is what you, have, you, already, you already have experienced. The rest uh, we are trying to build up uh, uh, today. And uh, so what we need to do this uh, analysis is sort of developing, I call it a classification scheme or a method for describing the properties of the technology. So we are not yet describing the technologies. We will come in the next weeks uh, also having people from, uh, say, from the companies coming and describing. For example, BTCina will come here and describe their technology. Uh, with Telecom Italia, they will come here and describe the energy atom, uh, uh, say, uh, protocols uh, and, uh, and architecture. Um, there will be, I put the announcement and the event on the Facebook page, uh, a one seminar uh, by Schneider Electric that will present the Connex protocol. So the three main, uh, not main, but three very important blocks of technologies will be described directly by people working or developing them, okay? So that uh, we'll get into detail in this way later. Right now, we are trying not, not yet, I said, to describe the technology itself, but to describe the properties or the characteristics of these technologies. So this is what we call classification. So uh, just as uh, uh, Automation technologies are all different beasts. Uh, there already is a technology <laughs> classification. It's easy to, to make a parallel with the classification of beasts or animal or living beings, actually. And it was one of the first systematic classifications. You can recognize the Linnaeus uh, uh, taxonomy of living beings. Uh, that by, by the way, the work that uh, uh, Linnaeus did uh, was, uh, was quite different from what we have today. Okay, so for example, uh, just to have it, if you can read there, there is no mammals there, so, which is one of the biggest uh, categories, but was not recognized yet at, at, at that point. But um, just to, to say that the problem of classifying things uh, is a very old problem. Uh, classifications are never, especially when we have complexity behind, are never static. They evolve with time and they evolve with the understanding of, of the different, uh, uh, in this case, animals or with the evolution of the technology in our case. So we are not developing something that needs to be statically or final or perfect, uh, but something that helps us in working with this. Uh, uh, okay, we have. Uh, uh, but the other issue is that uh, if we take the bio biological classifications, what you find is that they define uh, one huge tree from the, let's say, data structure point of view. So you have all the living beings that are divided into subcategories. Each one is divided into smaller categories and so on. And each node, you have one criterion for deciding how to split all the animals or plants or living beings in that, in that category, how to split them in the lower categories. Each node contains a rule. So, okay, you have a counter X or see whether it lays X or not, see whether it flies, see whether it has a beak or whatever. And at the, in, that node, in every node, there is a choice criterion. So you can walk, you can take any living being from bacteria to dinosaurs and start from the top and at every node apply the selection rule and that will tell you where to go in the lower node. And then you can go 
there will ne there's no reconvergence and there's no way of starting from any other point than the top. So it's just a one big hierarchy. Uh, in classification terms, it's called the taxonomy. Uh, taxonomy is a, a tree of terms, words. You have that in the, when you go to the library, uh, library books uh, are divided by subjects. And inside the subjects, uh, you can have the shelves, uh, and every shelf is uh, about a, a specific uh, sub subject, uh, no? so smaller subject. And maybe in the shelf, you can have the, the different uh, levels uh, that uh, divide the books according to how this sub subject uh, is organized internally. Hmm? And in a library or in biology, it's quite natural to do things in this way. One comprehensive hierarchy that deals with one point of view. In the library, the point of view is uh, the content. What is this book about? And we are splitting the domain of content of, uh, uh, of what, is, what the book is about. Um, here it's more complex because the, the, the question that you do at the different level changes. But this is, is not enough for us. Because we, can, we cannot have only one question to ask uh, for splitting the different technologies. Technologies are complex stuff. And uh, we need, of course, to have some hierarchical definition. So groups and subgroups and so on. That's quite uh, natural. But uh, we must realize that we need uh, different points of view to be considered at the, same, at the same time and with the same importance. What I mean is, uh, is it more important for you whether technology is wired or wireless, which is one criteria of splitting, or is it more important uh, whether, I don't know, it's, um, it can be programmable or not? There are different attributes. How it is connected, how it is programmable. You may have all the combinations, the, potentially, uh, then depends whether there are actual technologies that, that, do all, that are able to do all the possible combinations. But uh, it's like uh, having two different axes. One is the connect connectivity and the other is the programmability. So these aspects in the classification theory are called often faces, like the faces of, of a diamond, huh? that you can have different faces uh, of the same diamond, and you look at the diamond from different points of view. You need to cut it from different uh, directions. When you're classifying physical objects, you must choose one face, one point of view, to split the object. In the library, a book may be only in one physical location. And the physical location will be the same whether you enter from the front door or from the back door or from the side door. You always have the same classification, the same splitting, the same grouping. But since we are classifying not physical objects but conceptual entities, we are free to create more dif different, many, many different entry points to our library, to our classification. Each entry point will be a facet, a way of splitting items. Depending on how we enter, the items will be organized in a different way. If we enter from the connectivity wood door, then we will, be, we will see the shelves or the technologies divided by the type of connectivity. If we go out and we enter with from the programmability door, we will see the same items rearranged in a different way. Huh? It makes nice for the Harry Potter library. Just depending on how you enter, items will reorganize themselves. Actually, means that the item is one, but the overstructure that uh, is linked to, that links to the items, is more than one. There are many different ways of reaching the same item. And each item is sort of the, lies in the intersection of different choices. This is the mental model that uh, I'm trying to build. And uh, I try to sit down and uh, asking myself all the possible questions 
about uh, what makes uh, technology different from another, and this is the classification that they came out with. So what they want to do in the next uh, uh, couple of hours is uh, um, to work to uh, work with you on this uh, classification scheme, trying to uh, see the different points of view and the different alternatives. I, I, I hope it will not be too boring, but actually there are aspects uh, that will make it much easier to understand the different technologies later. Later, we can, we, when we we'll, uh, study technology, we, just, we will say, okay, but uh, we are learning about, we are talking about, I don't know, Modbus, the Modbus protocol. Okay, for us, Modbus will tick some items here, here, and there, and we, we are able to understand the main issues about the, this protocol in just one flash, because we, are, we have already the mindset for, for looking at it from different directions. The structure of this taxonomy or the multi-taxonomy, the facet, facet techno, um, taxonomy, is that I split uh, the description about the devices and networks. I, 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 my, uh, I, will make, I will make it wider in a second, but just for the big picture. Talking about the characteristics of the devices and the characteristics of the network that connects the devices together. We are always talking about connected devices. That's smart homes, that's ambient intelligence. Devices must be there and they must be connected. So let's talk separately about the property of the devices and the property of the network. Of course, they, the two are not independent, are cross-related. But just for, 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 let's say, for ease of reasoning, let's split the two. So in the right-hand side, you'll see what the questions or what criteria we have in discussing about the devices and on the left hand about the technology, or the network, the connecting technology in general. Hmm? Um, of course, uh, PowerPoint is not the right tool to do this because it would involve a lot of cut and paste and magnification and, and stupid work. And so I will work directly uh, with you on this uh, mind map uh, that I used uh, to create this taxon taxonomy. Huh? So that we will uh, navigate and explore parts uh, of the of this taxonomy and, uh, and reason about uh, what is there. In in presenting the different choices, I will uh, I try to make uh, uh, several examples about actual technologies that fit into these categories. Just to say that, okay, these categories are, are, are real, <laughs> are not just uh, made up. Uh, but uh, uh, so there will be just words that you already heard and we will see later in more detail. But at least we already know how to position them. Hmm? It's not exhaustive, they are just examples, huh? but, uh, but to help us. So I will start from the network. Um, and uh, when I select one node, you see an explanation appear below. Okay, so, so I, I try to make a short definition. So instead of slides, uh, you will have some interactive. On the website, uh, I exported all of this into a PDF document with nested items, so it will be easy to, to, to read. Uh, it will not very easy to navigate, but it's uh, easy to, to read. Uh, I, I still have to upload, but I will do this, uh, the source of this file so that you can say open and modify it uh, directly using this, uh, I don't know if you know it, it's a free mind is the name of the program. It's a free tool that you can have. So uh, the network discovered the characteristic of technologies uh, that allow the device to communicate and collaborate in the exchange of information. Uh, the definition you will find there are always I tried hmm, to make them as general, as general as possible because they need to apply to a wide set of uh, cases. And um, so in some cases we are using general, like exchange of information that may be actually anything, but uh, 
uh, it would get more specific as we go. So the question about the networks, I try to, I came up hmm, to these different uh, facets, these different point of view in which we may, we may classify the different uh, qualities of the networks. The first, the easier one, no, is infrastructure. How the devices communicate. So what is the medium, the physical medium that allows devices to communicate? And in this case, uh, the, we have the, these two, two big categories, wired and wireless, and there we also there can also be some mix between the two. And so we have uh, we may divide automation technologies in the group of wired technologies, so technologies that use an, a wired infrastructure to communicate. Uh, so uh, devices are connected through a set of wires, uh, and depending on the protocol, they may use two wires or more. Actually, there are also some protocols that only just use one wire, now because they already have a common mass reference because of the white. And uh, so we have all the big family of wired protocol, wired technologies. And on the other hand, uh, we have wireless technologies that use radio frequencies to exchange data. So in this case, devices doesn't need, don't need to be connected for the purpose of exchanging data. In some cases, they may be connected for power supply. So having a wireless device doesn't always mean the device can be moved everywhere, because in some cases, the device needs to be uh, connected to some power supply. You need to, to feed it with some energy. In other cases, the device already has its own source of energy. We will see this difference when we are talking about the devices. So it's a property of the device, how it gets its power, not a property of the network, not always. Hmm? It's a separate issue. Of course, there are <laughs> crossing between these issues, but right now we are just talking about, uh, you see the definition, how the devices communicate not how the devices feed themselves of, of energy. So uh, we see that the wired protocols are the Connex, uh, the Myopen, the Modbus, and so on. Uh, Myopen is just a strange name because it doesn't have any meaning, but it's actually, it's actually it's the, it's the brand name of the protocol by Bitticino, by the Bitticino company. In the rest of the presentation, I will just use Myopen and will not repeat Bitticino many times. Uh, for wireless, uh, you already have uh, some example uh, by using and playing with uh, Z-Wave devices, with Zigbee. But uh, today, you're already are using Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and uh, your uh, maybe remote control for your uh, uh, garage uh, is on, again, uh, uh, 433 megahertz. Or there's a lot of technology hmm, that, that are actually wireless. Uh, among the wired te the wire technology, I... Uh, I made a subclass there just to point out that in some cases, okay, for wire technology, you need wires. But do you need to install specific new wires or can you just reuse something that is already there? And this is the case of power line technologies. Technologies that use the power lines, like the name says, to convey also data, not just uh, energy. So they modulate data on top of the AC distribution lines, of the alternative current uh, uh, distribution lines. And uh, there are some standards, of course, in the US, X10, it's a very simple low level standard, but it's very popular. And uh, something more structured is long works that became recently echelon. For example, all the smart meters uh, that are installed in every house in Italy, they are using, they are equipped with some, this kind of communication. You cannot use it, but the, 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 the utility, the energy utility, NL, will use it to read your power consumption. Okay, they are using power line. They didn't put any additional lines. They are reading your data, so they are changing data, bits, packets of bits, uh, on top of the distribution lines. Hmm? Um, so this is the uh, one case in which it's wired, but you don't need additional wires. Hmm? Of course, there can be mixed uh, technologies, 
and they are more and more uh, frequent. Yeah? What about the EO, EO power line? Yeah, it's, uh, it's down there. Uh, about the supply. Yes, it's, uh, it's power over Ethernet is uh, using a data distribution line, so you already have a wide bus to convey also power. It's a way of power supply. Of uh, I, I put it uh, in the other. It's an, another, yeah, it's the opposite, actually. Hmm? It, from this point of view, how devices communicate, PoE is just a wire technology. It requires a wire for that exchange. And then you piggyback that wire also for sending some power. Hmm? So actually, we can add Ethernet here, traditional and with power. OK, uh, I said it's more and more frequent that uh, wire technology, especially, try to be more modern or more open and try to accommodate for wireless connectivity. Uh, for example, there was it's already several years that uh, in which Connex, which is fundamentally wide protocol, uh, opened uh, uh, or de defined a wireless extension. So there are nodes, Connex nodes, uh, that uh, say generate a small uh, wireless bridge uh, to connect other wireless uh, sensors mainly. The driver behind these uh, extensions, so wired protocol that also offer some wireless connectivity for some of the devices, the driving force commercially was being able to um, add the automation to uh, historical buildings, churches, uh, uh, villas, or whatever, where you cannot just go there and drill a wall, or, or uh, and so you need to be careful with uh, what you are installing. And so, most of the plant can be hidden, and so it can be wired because it's sort of more reliable and so on, but some parts uh, needed to be wireless. So these big wired uh, protocol uh, providers uh, um, provi propose some extensions. I'm not aware that the reverse ever happened. So I, don't, I didn't see any wireless protocol uh, to extend into a wired uh, uh, solution except uh, for extending the coverage. So you may have uh, a wireless plant, uh, I mean, let's see, a Z Wave uh, system, and you want to, you have a very large building, you want to connect different parts of a building, so you need to, let's say, uh, it may be more, more efficient to, to, to send, to connect them through a physical link, through an ether line, an internet line, or something like that. But it's just for bridging mainly of uh, different parts of the plant, not for actually hosting uh, devices. Hmm? So it would not be for that exchange uh, of devices. So this is the, one of the uh, simplest ways of splitting technologies. The other is uh, topology, so which is related, but not totally with the infrastructure. And the topology means uh, what is the, the, the actual path uh, that information travels when different devices exchange messages. If I have uh, 20 devices in this room, can they talk to each other directly? Or do all communication must go through number one, two, three, four, and then reach the 17? Or must they all go through one central gateway controller which then relays the information back and so on. And these are, it, it applies both to wired and wireless. The simplest uh, topology is the bus topology. And it was, and uh, it's the, the topology that is adopted by most, uh, not all, most of the wired technologies. So just have a couple of wires that go through your home or your building and connect all devices in parallel, electrically, in parallel to this couple of wires. And this constitutes a bus, a shared medium of communication. Every device, they are all on the same level. Every device can read the voltage level that is on the bus, 
so it can decode the data which is traveling on the bus. Traveling, we are talking about lower frequency here. So we actually, we, are, we can imagine that propagation, uh, say signal propagation would be infinite. So actually all the devices are seeing the same data at the same time in parallel. And every device can write on the bus and what can be read by all the other devices. This is the essence of the bus uh, say topology. One shared set of wires in which uh, every information written on the bus is automatically broadcast to every other device connected to the bus itself. Of course, you have to manage what is called the bus contention. So avoid that different uh, devices try to write on the bus at the same time, otherwise the message gets messed up. There are different techniques for doing that, but it's not our purpose to. Uh, Ethernet is a bus. Mm, Connex is a, is a bus, uh, Myopen is a bus, and so on. So it is, it's just the simplest way. It has limitations because you can imagine that when the number of devices increases, the contention on the bus also increases, so it will get more and more difficult to communicate unless you do some timing in the, in the, of the messages. But uh, it can scale up uh, quite well. It's the simplest one. It doesn't need any additional infrastructure. At any time, you may add one new device in every point of your plant. You just shoulder it in parallel. That's it. Zero infrastructure costs. Just a couple of wires. Hmm? Um, and so the communication among devices is direct. I write something, I know you can read it. There might be some addressing scheme so that everybody can understand whether the message is for it, for him or not. You may have a routed technology. So some nodes are able to communicate directly with some other nodes, but some other, some pairs of nodes don't communicate directly. Why? Because, because of the distance, for example. They cannot see each other. There may be wireless, the wireless signal is too, is too low because of uh, uh, segmentation of the network topology. We don't want all the traffic to go to all devices, just where, it need, where it's needed and so on. So there will be special nodes in the network that route the message to the right destination. So one node will send a message, either the message is directly visible or can, be, can reach directly the destination node, that's it, Otherwise, the message will be sent to one of the routing nodes that knows on the other side where to forward it. This is what happens, uh, if, for example, in all uh, uh, wireless uh, networks in which uh, if you have one building, uh, it's very unlikely that all the devices can actually see from the network point of view, um, from the radio point of view, all other devices. And so every device does its own job and then offers to route messages from others. Hmm? The same happens in the, in the Ethernet, in the TCP IP protocol and so on. So in many cases you have message delivered, but this message bounces through different uh, intermediate points until they reach the end. So you may imagine that there are many bus segments, wired or wireless, that are connected through nodes that route out messages from different segments. One particular case, especially uh, on wireless networks, is when this uh, routing topology is dynamic. So if you install an IP network and the Ethernet network in this building, you have specific switches routers that do this job in specific places. So the routing topology 
is fixed. In some cases, this topology, or the, using the routing and save mechanism, the topology can be dynamic. When you are using wireless smart plugs, they can be moved. Uh, and so which plug acts, uh, plays the role of a router to which other plug is something that may be changed because depending on the distances, for example, depending on the on the electromagnetic noise that we may have more on one side of the house and less on the others. So what happens is that uh, this kind of uh, wireless networks, uh, practically all of them, are constantly monitoring the quality of the radio links between the different devices. And they self-organize to create some mesh network. So it creates some uh, connection between the nodes, uh, and these connections uh, describe how messages are routed in a specific point in time. Half an hour later, maybe the mesh could have reconfigured because somebody switched off the device, so it can't route anymore because it's off, uh, because there's some uh, EM noise that uh, uh, lowers the signal to ratio quality of uh, the signal in one part of your house, so you try to avoid it or for many reasons. Okay, so these are uh, a, a dynamic topology. Uh, usually, this device uh, can automatically reconfigure themselves uh, to maximize the link uh, strength uh, between the different components. Uh, I have uh, one smart plug in my house. I have five, four, four or five of them in different places. One of them has, uh, for example, intermittent connectivity. It comes and goes. The mesh doesn't always, <laughs> uh, isn't always stable, and it more or less depends uh, on whether my neighbor switches off or on the intrusion system that happens. Radio frequencies are not infinite. Uh, another topology is the star topology, which is not used very much. Having one center and every device connected directly to that center. Hmm? It's very expensive in terms of uh, connectivity, if we are talking about wired uh, uh, protocols. And it's also uh, very demanding in terms of, uh, of, of distance, distance uh, if we are talking about wireless protocols, because every device would need to see and speak directly to the center device. So it's not, it's not used very much uh, in, in, in building automation in this case. Hmm? So this for the physical routing of messages, delivery of messages. Uh, and then we have, so this tells us how bits flow from one node to another. But the fact that, let's say, uh, there's the possibility of flowing some bits uh, doesn't mean that every node can initiate, start a communication with some other node. It depends on some hierarchical structure of the nodes. So physically, the nodes may be able to communicate directly or through routing with other nodes. Okay. Who starts speaking? I think they all can communicate, but who starts speaking? So there may be, even here, different solutions. Hmm? One, the simplest one is, also the oldest one, is the master-slave hierarchy. So there is one master node, and all the others are slaves. It means that every communication must be started, initiated by the master, always. So you all shut up unless I query you, unless I'm sending you a command, unless I'm sending you a request for information. So in a master-slave configuration, the master always starts the communication, and the slave must always answer to the master when, when uh, inquired. Hmm? Uh, and there are a lot of, uh, of uh, protocols that use this. It may seem rude, it may seem uh, old, it may seem bad, 
but it's actually it's very simple. So just imagining uh, USB, no, which is nothing to do with, with, with home automation. But when you are plugging something into an USB port, the USB devices cannot do anything, cannot send data, cannot talk to each other, exchange that to each other. They can only respond to the USB controller. So you see it in your device manager in Windows on your, your, in your operating system. You have USB controllers and USB devices. There are two different classes, masters and slaves. And the slaves cannot initiate anything unless masters ask them to do. Hmm? Um, Modbus, which is based on a bus topology, which would allow, could allow for free communication, is organized also in a master slave way. So we have a sort of a peer connection of different devices. But among all of these devices, one of them is the master, is the controller. And so all the other devices, there's no issue about bus contentions there. The master is the only one who is able to speak. He speaks to one device at a time and waits for the answer. So all the Modbus slaves are silent and just waiting for a comment coming from the master. In this case, there can be only one master. In some cases, uh, you may also have multi-master. So there, are, there may be more than one device that can play the role of the master. Usually, in some cases, also simultaneously, not always. Uh, another possibility is that each node, yeah? I have a question about the multi-master. Yes. Um, in such cases, how does the slave, I mean, to which master does he respond? What if, I mean, two different masters um, what, convey different contradictions? You're just a slave. So if you are a slave and you, if you have two masters, you will uh, answer to both. So I tell you on and you go on. And the other master immediately after tells you off, you go off. Uh -huh. Just in a sequence. Yeah. Yes, you just, you just obey. Depends on the sequence of, uh, or the temporal sequence of comments. Um, in peer-to-peer -peer hierarchies, okay, actually there's not a hierarchy in this case, all the nodes uh, play the same role. So in theory, every node could send a comment to every other node. Everyone is entitled to query the state of another node or to send a comment to another node. This is also the, well, uh, conceptually it's simpler because you just program one node to do its job and then it, it, you don't need any infrastructure to convey the communication. You don't need any master on these kind of networks. Uh, if, you tell, if you think about IP-based network, when you, when you connect your computer or your phone to the internet, uh, it's a node like any other one. So it can do whatever it wants. It doesn't need any permission, it doesn't need any master that tells you, okay, you can speak now. Hmm? Uh, also, Connect, for example, is a general automation protocol that is in this way. Every device can send and receive comments like any other devices. There's no specific master. Okay, there is one master, but it's not needed for, it's not required for communication. Nodes can freely contact each other. Um, this means that one node can also speak <laughs> when it's not being queried, which is different. Imagine just one alarm sensor that will tell you whether something is on fire. Huh? If we have one peer-to-peer -peer network, the fire sensor, as long as it's triggered, will send messages saying there's a there's problem. In a master slave, the fire sensor, even if it knows that there's a fire ongoing, needs to wait until queried by the master to say, okay, now there's a fire. It will never, it, it cannot say something on its own. It's not able to do that. Uh, there is another, um, I call that coordinator and notes. Uh, 
uh, which is a sort of a mixture of the two, because things are never so simple, uh, where the basic structure is of a peer-to-peer -peer hierarchy. So every node can communicate, but there is one or a small group of nodes that are more equal than others, if I want to copy this animal farm uh, sentence. Um, some nodes that are more important, that have more capabilities, so I wouldn't call them masters, I would try to use the term con controller or coordinator. So some node that is on the, on the peer with the, all the other nodes, so okay, it participates at the same level in the communication, but uh, it has some additional responsibilities. Usually this responsibility involves the management of the network. Checking that everything is going on, checking the allowed devices or something like that. Or communication thing with, with the external side. So in this case, this, this node is special because it, it's not just responsible for its own behavior, but it's also responsible for what the other devices are doing in some way. And uh, most, uh, many networks have as this uh, figure of uh, co coordinators. No? At, Totally, totally peer-to-peer -peer network. Uh, okay, you have, you have the internet, and this, that's the reason of its success, because every connected node uh, is free. Mm -hmm. But in many other, in most of the other networks, you already have one node uh, that needs to, to check, okay? It's not uh, totally decentralized. Okay, so we have uh, these two criteria, uh, how messages travel, and uh, who sends and receives messages to whom. Hmm? If we have a controller or master node, uh, okay, there are some cases in which it's not needed. You, we saw that uh, there are some, uh, for example, in the peer-to-peer -peer network, you don't need any controller. But when it's there, you also may have two different choices. One, which is the most common, is a special node that plays the role of a controller. So you need to have one item in your plant, which is the control. Just think about the Raspberry board for connecting to Z-Wave devices. That is the control. You, when, you, when you associate a new device, you associate it with that controller. Zigbee does the same. Uh, in Modbus also, you have one, one, one gate with one central node and so on. Uh, so it's a special device that is able to do this job. In other cases, let's say for more complex protocols, any node, let's say, could be promo or any node, um, depends, on, depends on its capability. But in principle, you don't have one specific node at the beginning who is the controller. But different nodes may take the role of the controller. Usually in this kind of networks, there is some sort of an uh, election mechanism. You see a lot of this into IP networks, into office networks and so on. For example, SMB is the, the file sharing protocol of Windows, but also the LNA and so on, where you have one computer that keeps track of which other computers are on the network and share this list, uh, the network neighborhood was called in some version of Windows, for example. There's one, in, on your network, there will be one computer that takes the, say, the, the job, the responsibility of keeping updated the list of computers connected. But no specific computer needs to be say, installed with this purpose. When one is, uh, say, switched on, when a new computer is switched on, there starts uh, an, an election mechanism on the network. It's all automatic, all transparent. It takes some time, so that's the reason why some computers take some, take time, to, some time to appear some, uh, on some cases. And uh, uh, then one wins and plays the role of the controller from now on until the next election. And uh, if, it's, uh, if, if there is a new election, then uh, maybe the new controller will be different. So there are some protocols, of course, they need more complexity in this case. So they need more capable devices to handle all these mechanisms. That's the reason why you don't find uh, usually these features in lower level or low cost, uh, let's say, protocol or devices. Once you go get something more complex, uh, it, every, not every device, but most 
devices had the capability and the power of acting as a coordinator. So the reasoning behind is why do we need to add one special node with that function? Anyone can do that. And so let them, let them decide and let's, let's solve the problem in software instead of adding additional hardware. If you have hardware powerful enough, you can move the role of coordination, let's say, to some software resource instead of a hardware resource. Um, okay, so this is uh, how the controller actually is realized. Addressing. Okay, every network must have an addressing mechanism. Addressing means that uh, I will be able, if I have two devices in the network, I, there must be a way to decide whether I want to send a message to this one or to the other one. So each of them must have a, a unique identifier, identification on the network. We call this unique identification the address of the device. Okay? Um, which is quite normal in every, in every network, uh, so that each device must be uniquely identified in the network. Hmm? In the network. So why it is connected to a specific network? Some device has already have an address which never changes. In some other cases, the address changes when the device is connected to different networks. So um, let's talk of the addressing while the device is connected. That, that may be a, a mechanism for assigning these addresses. The simplest one, and there may be a hierarchy of addressing also, of addressing mechanism. The simplest one is that each physical device has one specific address. Actually, one physical device has one specific address if, it's only, if it only has one network interface. If you take, uh, for example, one smartphone, it has a lot of, it, let's say, it belongs to a lot of different networks. It may be connected through Bluetooth, and it's a network, and it has an address on the Bluetooth network, the MAC address. It may be connected to Wi-Fi, and so it has a MAC address on the Wi-Fi network, and an IP address assigned by the network itself, and so on. So every network has a different addressing scheme. If you are talking about uh, smartphone devices, they usually only have one network, which is the network containing them. So we are talking about only just one scheme of addressing. If you are talking about uh, more complex devices, uh, you will start to have uh, different addresses uh, for the same device uh, if it's connected to different networks. So the address is always a, a device being connected to a network. And if the device is connected to many networks, it has different addresses on each of the networks. Hmm? Um, the addresses may be hardware defined. So the, every, every network interface, which is every Bluetooth chip, every Wi-Fi chip, every Ethernet chip that is ever shipped in the world has a unique MAC address, which is stamped inside the silicon. Okay, when you, uh, it's, uh, there are 40 bit, uh, for, sorry, 48 bit addresses. And uh, since they started to define the first version of the Ethernet protocol, uh, they assign different numbers. So every device in the world has a different MAC address. And if you have a device that has different uh, network interfaces, there, there's many of them. So it's a hardware defined address that's fixed. You don't need to assign it, the device already has it. Um, in some cases, for example, in the MyOpen protocol, addresses are assigned also in hardware, but uh, manually. So it's not the manufacturer who stamps the address in the silicon, but it's the installer, the, the, the person who do, who does the installation who sets some jumpers to define the address. You find it uh, in many, for example, the My Garage door. In the, in the there's some jumpers to set the address uh, of the uh, of, for, for, for communication with the remotes. Hmm? Or in other cases, these addresses are assigned by software. So when the device connects to the network, the network assigns an address 
to that device. This is what happens with internet connections. Every time you connect to internet, usually you get a different address. It's a software assigned address. It doesn't matter, actually, as long as the address is kept for the duration of all the connection. So as long as you are connected to the network, you keep that address. And so other devices can identify you because you have that address. If you disconnect from the network, then you are no longer part of the network. And when you rejoin, you might be a different device or you might be seen as a different device. Um, Okay, in some cases, uh, you may also have in some devices, actually, there's a serial number of the product, which is used as a, as a device address. Mm -hmm. uh, you have it in all the microprocessors, actually. Oh, every microprocessor already have a serial number inside. Of course, when I say serial number or hardware address uh, is not something that is really fixed because there are a lot of ways uh, of faking that number. But let's, let's start, uh, let, let's reason about uh, using things in the, in the intended way, not trying to, to fake them or to hack them. Okay, but in many cases, you also need more in uh, home automation or business automation than in uh, computer networks. You need to be addressing groups of devices at the same time. Switch all the lights on. So a command like this uh, may be done by sending a command switch on to every light. Or if we could have a group addressing, so there's an address that corresponds to a group of devices, then we could send just one message to this group address and many devices will receive that command. Um, we have that also in data networks, in Ethernet, they are called multicast messages, but they are not very used. No, they, they are used maybe in some cases for doing multimedia streaming, but not, not even then they are uh, they're always used. Um, these group addresses are very useful. Uh, also for one, one uh, I don't know, imagine a one device, one sensor that sends out its data. And there are different devices in the system that want to know about the data. So the, those other devices that want to receive the data may join the group. Okay, I, I, know I want also to be part of that group. So this group uh, and different, the networks actually behave in quite a different ways, the different technology concern this, how these groups are formed, whether they are static, whether they are, can be changed dynamically, but this notion is, uh, is often there. Hmm? And there's also the reverse. The reverse is that uh, you may have one device, uh, one physical device, uh, that actually includes many real devices which are integrated into the same box. Imagine the multi-sensors. In the lab, you have one sensor that measures uh, four quantities, uh, presence, temperature, humidity, and lighting. Actually, there are four different devices that are working independently and they are sharing the same network interface. But when you send a command, you need to send a command to, to get the data, for example, to the temperature or to the lighting sensor. So there is some sub-addressing mechanism which is able to address uh, sub-portions of a device under the same network address. The network address is just one because the, the radio interface is one. But behind this interface, there are many devices. For the multiple sensors, it will be easier because the different four different devices do different things. So they cannot be confused. So if, if I say get the temperature, I'm talking with a temperature sensor, not with lighting sensor. But imagine a, um, a relay block. No, it's very common to have uh, a lot of um, relays in a, in a, that open and close circuits, uh, and they come in blocks of four or eight. So all the devices inside the same, all the, sorry, all the relays inside the same device are the same. 
It will, they will be just a relay number one, number two, number three, number four. So you need some way of, of addressing portions of a device whenever this device is a complex or composite device. For example, Connex calls these endpoints. Hmm? Modbus calls them register ranges. So there are different ways of calling things. Let's try not to get confused. Huh? There are different ways of, of doing the same, let's say, uh, of, uh, of reaching the same goal, which is of addressing sub-functions. And every technology has a different way of doing that. This is the main, uh, usually one of the first points uh, to study. When you are approaching a new technology, you need to study, to, uh, to understand how it thinks, how it works. Uh, usually, you start by understanding how devices are addressed the addressing scheme. And that also tells you a lot of how devices can communicate to each other. Hmm? Okay. Discovery. What do I mean by discovery? Whether the network is able or includes a capability of determining or discovering which devices are connected. And maybe also what is the nature of, the, of these devices? Give, give me a list of the, of the connected devices. And this is a Boolean attribute. Either the network is discoverable or not. A discoverable network, okay, means it has a discovery. You can ask to whom? Well, to a controller. For having a discovery, usually you need to have a controller. You cannot just ask to everybody, okay, tell me who is there. You could in a broadcast, but it would be very inefficient. It would just... Uh... So usually there's one node with you that, that has the responsibility of keeping track, track of who's connected and can give you the list. In some cases, uh, I think about Connex, uh, you can ask the controller, please do a network discovery. And it tries to communicate uh, on the network to the devices and gives you the sort of the list of the devices connected. So it's not an information that the controller has at any time. It doesn't need it to work. It only needs to send them commands to, to, the, to, the, to the node, but it doesn't need the, 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 the connect controller doesn't need to know the list of devices for working. So it's a special command saying the controller, please give me the list. And at that point, the controller will, will explore the network. Uh, in other cases, uh, for example, in wireless networks, uh, when you have to uh, mesh, when you need to keep alive a mesh of devices, you need to know at all times which devices are active, which are sleeping, which are connected, which are uh, offline, and so on. Because it's part of the working of the network. And so in this case, the controller always has an updated information about which devices are present. It needs them, for example, to, to keep the mesh alive. So different type of discovery. One is already built into the network itself, and the other is some additional capability that the devices uh, needs to, need to implement. Or there can be networks that are not discoverable. It means that there is no way, by sitting at your desk, to understand what is connected to the bus, for example. No way. OK, you could, you could try to send comment to all possible addresses. It will take a long time, it's just a broadcast or sorry, an exhaustive search for devices. But even in those cases, uh, okay, you can see that some device responds to that address, but maybe it doesn't tell you what kind of device it is. It doesn't identify it. So you see that something is responding, but what is it? Hmm. So there is no, in many, in, for example, in the MyOcpen protocol, not in the Modbus protocol, which is very used, there is no mechanism for this. So you already need to add this information. Every application already needs to have 
out of band, like we say, so uh, without resorting to the network cap capabilities, which, is not, which are not available, which are not there, um, you need to have uh, one way of getting this information. So the person who does the network configuration needs to write down a piece of paper the addresses of the devices. The application needs to know which addresses to call because it knows that there's a device behind that number. It's, uh, it's strange, but um, many, networks, many networks actually don't have any mechanisms like this. And of course, you can, yeah, the, you, with these two different sort of networks, uh, the, the applications uh, will work in a very different way hmm? because this uh, crucial information. And also, the, 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 the configuration of the devices will be different. Okay, another point, let's move to higher level. Uh, communication. Communication is somewhat related to what we call the, the hierarchy. But again, you can mix different categories. Uh, with communication, I, I define it uh, when information messages are exchanged among devices or nodes. So first, uh, we in the hierarchy say what is the flow, and here when in the time from the timing point of view. Uh, the simplest case, which is the only one that is available in master-slave networks. So if you have a master-slave network, you must work in this way. If you have a more complex network, or a peer-to-peer -peer network, uh, or a control network, you may also in some cases have the other possibilities. Uh, but poly may be used, may be used on, every, on every network, always, because the simplest one. A device may be queried or sent a command by the master or by the controller or by the application. In a pure polling, if you are only do, doing polling, the device uh, will never send any information unless queried by the controller, for example, or by the application. So in master-slave, it matches. Um, so in order to have updates about what the devices are doing and what are the temperatures in, in my sensors, the controller or the application behind the controller must have a so-called polling cycle. I'm polling each of you to check whether you are awake, one by one. And when I finish with the last one, I start again from the beginning. I'm doing a cycle, and that in each cycle, I pull one by one all the devices. You can imagine <laughs> uh, the complexity of the application because uh, this is working master-slave. Master-slave is, uh, for example, for the Modbus, pro Modbus protocol, is the only way of working. But Modbus doesn't have any discovery. So for doing the polling cycle, I do it blindly because I don't know who is there. I cannot see who is there. I must know it. And so I'm polling something that I know is there, but I cannot see it. If some, somebody new joins, uh, I, will not, I will not be updated about it. So it's all responsibility of the application. The, for the device, the life is much simpler. It only responds when queried. But for the application, it needs to track. It's a more, much more low-level low interaction. It must keep track of everything. And the network doesn't help the application to know what, when, have, when something happens. Um, this polling cycle, I said, it usually happens at regular time intervals. What are these intervals? 50 milliseconds? 20 minutes? Depends. Depends on the application. If you are checking temperatures, 20 minutes, 30 minutes is more than okay. If you are checking the movement of some doors or something like that, maybe 50 or 100 milliseconds would be more suitable. Of course, you may have polling cycles running at different speeds uh, for different devices. So maybe there's some high-speed devices that uh, are in a tighter loop and some, let's say, less important devices that you may query just once every 20 iterations or something like that. It's all the application 
that runs behind the controller who decide. Yeah? Uh, maybe I misunderstood something, but why in the case of uh, master and slave um, uh, arrangement, it will only be made once? Couldn't technically the master while slave Let me talk about synchronous events. Uh, in, so this is polling. There's one controller that queries. In the other cases, uh, synchronous or asynchronous communications, we say that the devices are sending their information. So communication in synchronous or asynchronous communication is initiated by the devices. So in master slave can be done, right? So in synchronous communications, the device, every device has a schedule, an internal schedule. Every thought seconds or milliseconds, it must send out a measurement, for example, or a date or a status. Okay? So uh, devices spontaneously send out their data with a frequency that in some cases can be programmed, in some cases not. And, uh, and send out this data. So the, the role of the controller or the application is just to wait for this data coming in. When data comes in, okay, it can be recorded and can be stored and so on. But the device that's, that pushes the data instead of the controller pulling and pulling the data from the devices. Um, actually, this uh, sort of uh, timing uh, may happen at two different scales. There is one very tight scale, which is used uh, in uh, control application properly, which is the nature, for example, of the CAN protocol. CAN is the protocol that is used inside your car. When you're driving or braking uh, or, or steering or, or throttling your car, uh, every, let's say, part of your car is exchanging messages with this protocol. And in this kind of protocol, you have a fixed time frame, time window, in which every device is allocated some bits, bits or microseconds, depending on how you measure them in the time. So every device must send out is uh, it may be 16 bits at the 17th slot of every cycle. So the cycle is the same for all the network and repeats itself identically. So everything is predetermined. Everything is known at the beginning. You, I know that that device must respond. This, all the devices share a clock, now share the same clock, share the same time reference, and know exactly when to speak. They have those 25 microseconds to send out their 16 bits. That's it. And at every cycle, when everything repeats, it repeats identically. Every device speaks at the same time in turn. This is usually done for control purposes so that you have a completely, uh, you have no, uh, no risk of late communication or devices that need to communicate, but they, always, they find maybe the bus busy or so on. So it's a way of giving fairness of communication on a shared infrastructure like a bus. In uh, I mean intelligence, in smart homes and smart buildings, uh, usually we don't need this kind of tight control. So we use a, a loser, let's say, synchronization, which every device has its own clock, and when it's triggered, it will send out the data. It may happen that at the point in the network is busy, and so the data gets delayed for, by a bit. Hmm? But we don't uh, usually, when the, the amount of the delay is relatively small compared to the frequency of the data, Mm, we don't care about that. It's not an issue in this case. We are not doing real-time control. So you are more in this, in this second case. The third case is similar to the second, uh, but we remove the need of having constant time intervals for sending out data. So devices may transmit data when they want. Well, when they're programmed to do that. And uh, uh, so we are trying to 
sort of minimize the amount of transmission by sending out only interesting information. The device speaks when it, it has something interesting to say. Something interesting may be, I don't know, if it's a presence sensor that it detects some presence. So at that point, it will tell me, it will send out a message, presence. You don't need every second for 24 hours to get the message about no presence, no presence, no presence, no presence in the room. Because that would be, that's the default state. Once there is something interesting, then the device speaks. So you only have the messages that tell you when something changes. So for the case of a present sensor, which is a binary sensor, changing means from true to false and vice versa. If you are talking about uh, um, meters or real, real valued sensors like a temperature sensor or an energy sensor, well, usually you set a threshold and you get a message when the temperature changes for more than one degree. Or the temperature goes above or below, the threshold can be absolute or relative. So it can be when there's a change, relatively, or a relative change compared to the last reading, the last message, or an absolute threshold when the temperature goes above 20 degrees or below 15. So you can program, you can configure the device and tell the device what are the conditions that should trigger the sending of a message. And in, when this condition is met, the message is sent at the time immediately, spontaneously by the device. Um, usually, these two conditions, the two capabilities are combined. Uh, if you have, uh, for example, Z-Wave sensors, usually work this way. If you take a temperature sensor, it will tell you when the temperature changes above a given threshold. And anyway, it will send you a sample of the temperature every 15 minutes. So there will be a slow synchronous communication just to keep things updated. And the fast, just in time communication when something interesting happens. This is the most interesting, most advanced way of communicating. Of course, it's only possible on, on networks and protocols where the devices can talk, can broadcast this information and can send it to, the, to other interested devices. So it requires a more intelligent network like the modern ones and not the, the dumb bus networks. Um, I would propose to Having a stop here, just for getting some air, then we continue after a small break, if you're okay, because the, the list is not extremely long, but it can be tiring at this point. Hmm? Okay. So let's continue about this uh, overview. Um, we have a, a few items uh, still to discuss on the network side, and then we'll see about the devices. Uh, data handling, uh, I can call data handling, if, 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 even if I don't, I don't like really this name, but uh, uh, to, to describe how the network models and uh, considers the data being exchanged between the devices or with the controller. And again, we have uh, different uh, possibilities. The simplest way, which uh, I think nowadays is only being supported by Modbus and a couple of other industrial protocols, is a, a register-based model. So what is the, if I had to make a, a conceptual, a mind model, a conceptual model of a device, of the information of a device, how would I describe it? How would I draw it? Uh, in the case of the register-based uh, data, the device is just seen as a set of memory locations. So you have many registers, many registers, usually there are eight bits, many locations of eight bits each, in which you find bits, you find binary numbers. 
So that device may have 24 registers, for example, of eight bits each. Then you know, so this information that you need to have, the device will not tell you, the network will not tell you, you know that the first register contains, uh, for example, the temperature. The second register contains uh, uh, the status uh, of, uh, I don't know, the, the, the consumed power or, or whatever. So you must know which registers contain which values. And it's even more complex than that. Maybe you can have one register in which the eight bits represent eight different flags, whether a given uh, know, relay, for example, is open or closed. Or we may have uh, real number, floating point numbers that require 16 or 32 bits, bits and so you must uh, pair two registers of, or make a group of four registers, read them, and then decode the bits and so on. So it's something actually, actually you have a, a matrix of bits, given a register by given a number of bits for, for each register, and then you read the bits and decode them using some information that you know about how the device represents this information. So it's a very, let's say, low-level representation, a bit-based representation. And this register may be read-only registers, so registers that you can only read, and this usually relates to data that uh, is measured by the device, status about the device. If you have a temperature, a temperature sensor, you can only read the temperature value that it's measured, you cannot change it, you cannot write that register. Or you may have write registers, registers in which, in which you write the values, and this can be used to change the configuration of the device or to send a command. There's, in this case, there is no notion of commands. There is only the notion of, okay, I wrote a value in this memory location, and so the device will act accordingly will change its behavior, will do something because I wrote this value there. Mm -hmm. So again, it's a very low level model. Uh, mm, you, you can guess it's being used by Modbus, which is the, among all of these is one of the uh, lowest level, uh, let's say, make, makes the lower level choices. Again, it's, it's very simple. The, the, the main issue is that uh, you must, before doing anything to the device, you must exactly know how that specific device uses the registers. And I can assure you that every device is different from any other ones, from any other one. And then uh, the, the second and third are actually available when you have a, a network that allows for asynchronous messages. So for example, you can think about explicit comments. A command is a, a, a message, a packet of bits with a specific format in which you have some usually some common code and some common parameters, and you're sending that, you're addressing this command to one or to a group of, of devices. So this can be sent asynchronously. Usually the sender may be the controller, or when you have some peer-to-peer -peer communication, maybe any other device that sends a comment to other devices, and so on. So it's just a, uh, say more, more high level, because you can explicitly say, okay, uh, I ask you to do this. To do, this, to do this information or to give me that, that other information, that data. So that can be command executable commands, do something, reach on, or query commands. So it's much more similar to how we model things at the higher levels. And this also happens at the network level. And all, um, let's say, the, the most uh, modern or more used protocol like Connex, my open and the way, reason in this way, work in this way. Actually, uh, when you have a master-slave connection, you, have, you don't have many options. In, in other cases, you have the option so of doing something which is more rich, let's say. Um, and the other is uh, uh, notifications, which just reverse messages to comments. So notification is a, is a message, which is, it's a response without uh, the query. Uh, it just sends uh, the device some data to whom is interested. Usually there is some mechanism for deciding which, who is interested in, uh, in which notifications and so on. So basically we have, uh, um, for, for us it's easier to think about comments and notifications, so messages being exchanged when they are needed. Actually much, uh, it's much more 
so it's difficult to map uh, the, the register-based behavior, even if it's, uh, it's still quite. Uh, uh, by the way, there, uh, some advanced devices, like for example the more complex Connex devices, which use uh, command-based uh, uh, interaction, may have uh, additional capabilities or may have configuration variables and so on. When a device has some capabilities that go beyond the specification of the network, so the network will specify this set of commands, but you can do more, you cannot send a new command. You just can send one command with uh, some data payload, which is again in terms of registers of bits. So usually in some complex devices, the configuration of the device is done by sending a command which writes some value in some internal register. So in some way, you try to bypass the, the, the semantics of the network because you don't have the specific command to send, you send a generic configuration command in which you go and write some specific register. So behind the scenes, you always have, actually, the, the devices work with registers. In some cases, they show them at the network level. In some cases, they hide them be, behind some higher level, say, semantically meaning comments, but they are always there. OK, now we have two issues about the communication protocols, transfer protocol and application protocol. Uh, some of you are doing the computer networks uh, course in this, uh, in this semester, so they, they understand the difference. The transfer port protocol is how binary messages are packed in order to be transmitted over the wire or over the, the, the wireless channel. So at this level, we are only concerned on how the messages are transmitted, are encoded, and we don't care about the meaning of the message, what's inside. That would be the scope of the application protocol that tells us how to organize the data inside the messages that are being, that are being sent by the transfer protocol. And uh, uh, for transfer protocols, uh, I, I, there are many of them, too many to list here. I tried only to make some groups. Uh, first is uh, technologies that use uh, open and or standard protocols. So protocols, I call them open and uh, standard when they are public. So there is a specification which is available to everybody. Usually, in many cases, this specification is being blessed or published by some specification, some uh, standardization authority or issue or agency or association or, what, or whatever. And usually, in these cases, everybody is allowed legally, not just technically, is allowed legally to read and write these kind of messages. So you can read, you can decode, you can send comments because you know how these uh, send, sorry, messages, they are not yet comments, I don't know what it is. At the, transfer, uh, at the transfer level, we don't know what data we are sending, but we can send messages over the wire, over the network, because we can know how to construct them. And uh, in this case, we can also build the devices, components that use uh, this technology. Everybody can do that. Um, but one important case of these open protocols are all the protocols that use internet infrastructure for, uh, for communication. So all of what we are starting to call the Internet of Things, so objects that are already able to communicate through the Internet protocol. They have an IP address, they can send and receive messages using IP or using TCP IP protocols. This is one specific, of course, TCP IP is one of the more, more known, more widely known open protocols everybody can uh, create a device that uses TCP IP and send it to and use it to communicate with others. Okay. We don't need any permission to build a new device that uses this protocol and to, to sense it. But of course, it can also be done with other types of, of protocols. For example, ZigBee is also a, a free protocol. You have all the documentation available. Okay. It's not easy to build a chipset that speaks ZigBee. Okay. 
there are some one com commercial available, but you can you could start up your own production if you want. There's no say permission to ask for. Uh, other protocols uh, still uh, I still call them standard because they are published, they are described somewhere, but uh, they are proprietary standards. I mean a standard that's being defined by one company or by a small group of companies. Okay, they decide to develop a standard for their own system that probably very likely they are using it for their components that they are trying to sell and build, uh, but then they decided to, to publish this. Um, and then it depends. In some cases, uh, uh, to, div to use these standards, uh, these protocols, you need permission. You need to join a consortium, you need to join an association, you need to have your applications or devices certified by the association before, so you need, to, you need a stamp for them, from them after they pass some, uh, uh, say, certification procedure. This is the same for Connex, for example. If you want to work with Connex, not just to install a plant, okay, but to develop new components, you need to join the Connex consortium, an association, Joining means paying, and only if you join, you can have access to the documentation of the protocol. So the documentation is there, it's, it's complete, there's everything you need, but you need to be part of, this, of the association to read it. Hmm? Of course, you have to pay for, the, for, the, for joining the association. And then if you want to develop a component that uh, you want to sell as a Connex, compo a Connex uh, switch, for example, your component needs to be certified by the association. So you develop it, you create a prototype, and you submit it to the association for certification. They will do a lot of tests, and you will be allowed to send a component and to call it Connex only if uh, you pass the certification. This is quite good from some point of view, because uh, on the market you will find components that are guaranteed to work together, to work well, because there's some sort of uh, certification. On the other hand, if you take uh, uh, Z-Wave, it's the same kind of, uh, of situation, uh, where, for example, you have uh, uh, the Sigma Design, which is a one single company who developed the technology and then decided to publish the specification. Again, uh, you can have access to the uh, specification only if you join the association. Of your own components, if you are a member of the association, but in that case, there is no specific certification for devices. So you are responsible for certifying or for doing interoperability tests on your devices. And this creates some situations where Okay, a device uses some technology but is not fully interoperable with others uh, because there are no central authority and it's more left uh, uh, to, the, to the various de developers. Hmm? So it depends. So the manager, while the management of an open standard is always free and it can also become risky because actually you get, you don't remember, but in the early times, I'm doing a, 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 a parallel, in the early times of the Wi-Fi networks, uh, Wi-Fi started uh, uh, with some specification that was an open and public specification from the IEEE institution. And uh, uh, manufacturers started to, to build devices. And there were a lot of interoperability issues. They didn't work together unless they were of the same brand. That's why at after the fact, later, they invented the sort of Wi-Fi certification. Because people started to develop, uh, but didn't, uh, they were more rushing to get the product out uh, than to get the standard right, hmm? to get the implementation right to the standard. And uh, so it's, it's easier to get into the market, but it's also more dangerous because you can find devices of every, of every kind, be, um, and not all having the, the, the right quality, let's say. And so if the success of your technology depends on the quality of the last of the providers 
that are trying to sell components and uh, it's, it gets more difficult uh, to, to scale up, to scale up actually. Hmm? This is one of the reasons I think why Zigbee is having a hard time in finding consensus compared, for example, to Z-Wave. Z-Wave uh, is uh, older, it's very similar, but uh, there are much more components because the specification is stricter. There is no certification, but uh, at least the chipsets are only sold by a couple of companies. So actually the hardware is blind, is, uh, is, is fixed. Mm -hmm. You cannot do so much. With Zigbee, there are mo mo many more resellers and manufacturers, and then creates a situation where you have uh, maybe less devices, and these few devices even don't work together very well. Mm -hmm. It's changing, but uh, it gets, uh, to get a critical mass with an open standard, it gets more consensus. With a closed standard, it gets a, 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 say a core set of companies working on the standard, and they, will, they can start the market, actually. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's less of a technology issue, it's more of a marketing issue, of course, but uh, we need also to take it into account. By the way, property standard, uh, some of them, even if they're property, um, proprietary, they may be generally available. For example, the MyOpen standard, which is developed by BTCino, is uh, public. So you can go there and download the specification and start using it. Hmm? Uh, you cannot uh, build new products without their permission. Actually, they will never give you the permission because they want to own uh, all the, all the, they want to own the bus. But at least they are specified it so you can develop applications that are using that protocol without uh, any specific, uh, while, uh, for example, in Connex, you have to, as, as I said, you have to join the association just to be able to read the specification. The specification is not public. You cannot buy it. Of course, you can find it if you search in the right places, but legally, you cannot have it unless uh, you are part of the Connex association. And it's not uh, small things. It's several thousand euros per year. So you really have to be committed uh, to developing and to make a business to join the association. For universities, less, but uh, it's also, hmm? and uh, so the market dominance can uh, cause that. And then there is some people, some companies, who just don't like uh, using one of the 200 different protocols available out there to implement their network, and they want to develop something custom. Too many times I saw that. People that say, okay, but I, I do this better. So people, uh, I just remember one, one company I visited some months ago that developed their own time protocol, uh, some time schedule uh, protocol to manage uh, smart homes, actually. Instead of using, for example, the CAM protocol, which is already there, that's the same thing, they, they build it from scratch. So they created the, 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 the protocol, the, the hardware, the firmware, everything. You always find some cases. In some cases, it's maybe it's useful. You want to have some specific constraints. But you should also consider that today, even rocket science, even space applications tend to use as much as possible available technologies and not develop custom ones. So if, if a rocket doesn't need something specific and can do with existing technologies, why are you so special that you need to develop something new? Uh, so, but uh, unfortunately there are many, many companies that think that they need to own everything. So they start from the bits, from the, from the, from the voltage levels and go up and lose a lot of time in, in recreating something that's already existing. More or less the same applies for the application protocols. The application protocol means uh, what data we, do we send, not how. Uh, again, we can think about the open protocols, open standard, again approved by some uh, authority. And uh, for example, you see that ZigBee is uh, it's a standard at the two levels. If you talk about the B specification, it has uh, the transport level, the network level, and then on top of that, it has a set of application 
profiles, they call it in the ZB case. It means that, okay, if you're bidding a lighting application, you should send messages formatted in this way, with this meaning. If you're doing home automation, it's much more complex, you're, you're, you need to send the commands in this method. What happens, for example, is that many use a, a, usually an open standard or an available standard for the transport level, and maybe don't use it at the application level because they want to use just a, that as a transport for getting data uh, around and then format the data as they want. It's much more difficult to be, say, compliant at the application level than at the transport level. At the transport level, you, are, you already find the chipset available with the firmware that do all the work for you. So there is little reason to even think about uh, formatting at the, level, at the low level. At the application level, it's usually, it's usually work you have to do. And in many cases, it's simpler to do it yourself in some way than to really understand the standard and do it in the right way. In the short term, it's easier. But of course, it creates all the interoperability issues that, uh, that we know. The same goes for proprietary standards. And proprietary standards, in some cases, may also run on top of uh, uh, open transports. It's, uh, there are two independent levels, of course. And what, uh, and what you see is that the, the, um, the application protocol is very often ad hoc. But we also do that. No? If you imagine that uh, the dog gateway that we are using in the lab has some application level interface, which is REST, which is specific to dog. It just, there are no standards saying what, are, what, are the, what is the format of the REST calls for that specific gateway. So we had defined one specific ad hoc application protocol that uses TCP IP, of course, and HTTP as transport protocols. So this is found very, very often. So an application level protocol that runs on top of standard transport, standard transport protocols. Device association is, is another specific uh, issue that uh, may or may not be required uh, in some network. Uh, and in some way it's linked to discovery, but it's not the same thing. Device association means uh, how can a new device join an existing network? What is the procedure? I bring in here a new device, how can, it make, I, how can I make it work with the existing network? And uh, there are different possibilities. For some networks, uh, you need it. Actually, for the networks who don't have any discovery capability or any management capability, you don't need to do anything. You just connect the device, and if somebody else knows the address, it can talk to the device. Otherwise, it just sits there. Uh, when you connect to an Ethernet connection, you just plug the cable. If you know the address, if you have the correct configuration, you can talk to others. But you're part of the network in the same time you are plugging the, the cable in. You don't require anything special. Uh, of course, you need the external information in order to work. It's always the same. The information is either provided by the network or you need, it, you need to know it at, at the different levels. You may have some... Uh, Configuration needed. So you need, before connecting the device to the network, to configure it in some way, to give some addressing, for example, that is compatible with the address of the network. In May Open, you can connect the device, you give an address that should be consistent with the rest of the network. You are giving the address explicitly, it's not the network that assigns it, and so you must configure it correctly. So the device should be configured in a correct way so that when it's connected, it will be integrated. Or there should be, there can be, uh, sorry, and, and this is, is common to many wired protocols. Since the wiring, the connection of a device is, needs to be done with a screwdriver, you take the network down, you add the device and so on, there is usually a configuration phase in which you integrate the device into the network. But for uh, wireless networks, uh, 
you don't need or you don't want something so complex. You want the network to take care as much as possible of assigning and configuring the device in order to operate with uh, this network and with the other devices in the network. And uh, so I call the, I use the term association for a process that is able to bring a device, an automatic or semi-automatic process that is able to bring a device into a network. And uh, I call the explicit association when this mechanism has to be started explicitly. Uh, for example, with the Z-Wave or Z-Bee smart plugs, uh, you need to associate them explicitly. So you need to bring the gateway or the controller into association mode, press a button on the gateway, press a button on the plug, and then they, they are meshed. So this needs to be done explicitly. You need to be aware that you are bringing a device. Then it's extremely simple because all the data exchange is done at the network level. You don't see, you don't need, you don't need to put in configuration information. But you need to start the process explicitly. A plug there doesn't communicate until at least once you associate it with the network. Um, usually this association also, and the same goes for um, uh, Wi-Fi, no? when you have the WPS button for easy association. You push a set of button, and for a short period of time, the Bluetooth pairing. When you need to send or associate a device uh, Bluetooth, via Bluetooth with another one, you need to, to have a shared code and then the confirmation and so on. This process involves the human in order to be sure that you really want that specific device to be associated with that specific network. It's a security issue. You don't want anyone walking to your home with something in his pockets and this device will associate with your network devices and start doing stuff with your home. In order for something in his pocket to work in your house, they need to do something like pushing a button here and pushing a button there that will be visible, okay? And in this process of pushing buttons or explicit association, usually the devices exchange some secrets, some secret, secret key, some cryptographic value and so on, so that the key is, is uh, the, say, the permission of entering this network a second time in the future. Once they are associated, uh, this, associa this association should not be repeated. It just stays there because they exchange some information. In some cases, this information is also used to encrypt the communication. So nobody else can read it. But, so you have this process. In other cases, uh, you, have, you want to have something even, much, even simpler. And uh, uh, where, let's say, you can accept that the physical presence is enough uh, for giving an authorization. Or when the authorization is already given at a different level. For example, USB. Uh, the, when, you, when you are plugging something into that, the operating system starts the association procedure, checks the driver, checks the device type, and so on. You don't need to do anything more than plugging it into the network. Because, okay, you are there physically. So your presence is there, it doesn't need, doesn't need to be verified by pushing buttons in the right times. DLNA, you know, DLNA is the protocol that uh, are used by media centers, smart TVs, and so on. No? You put a TV in your house, and it immediately can see your media center, your, uh, the, the, the videos that you have in your digital library if it's uh, shared on the network. What prevents uh, your neighbor, the TV or your neighbor, from seeing your movies? The TV doesn't have any password. The DNA doesn't have any authorization. It's the Wi-Fi. So in order to see your uh, movies, uh, you need to be connected to your network, to your local at our network in your house. So either you have a cable, and of course uh, your neighbor will not drill a hole during the night to send a cable, uh, to plug it, uh, or you need to have a Wi-Fi connection. And so the authentication 
is at the lower level, the network level. So at the application level, there is no authentication required. Mm. It's a, of course, it's a trade-off. And the designer of this protocol wanted the communication to be as easy as possible, as accessible as possible to people who don't have any, say, technical expertise. So they dropped some of the security. And they made the association process automatic. You just plug it in, maybe you enter the Wi-Fi password, and you're done. And you see the list, there's automatic discovery, automatic joining, pairing, and so on. So there are these two uh, possibilities. So after this, the devices are recognized. In these three cases, the devices are recognized by the network in some way. In the first case, uh, the network doesn't have the notion of uh, recognizing a device, and so they are just there, and they are open to communication. OK, the last point is the configuration at the network, at the network level. So in, in some cases, some networks need or want some configuration at the network level. In many cases, uh, there is no issue to do. There's no, nothing specific. In some cases, uh, uh, you need uh, to have some specific tool or some specific procedure to define some parameters. Think about TCPIP in your home. Just a very, very simple configuration, like the net mask uh, and, uh, and, um, and, the, and the address to give a uh, very few parameters, but you need to give them at the first time. Uh, more complex with connex also. Uh, you need to connect, and uh, when you activate, uh, when you buy a new con connex controller, the router, uh, you can't just plug it and expect it to work. You must connect and configure it so that it decides which kind of addressing you have, how many network segments you have, and so on. So there's an initial procedure to set up the network. Again, when you have wireless networks, uh, this uh, configuration procedure is also needed, but it's being hidden to you. It's made as much as possible as, uh, automatic. It's managed by the, 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 the mesh controller, that uh, once you have associated the devices, decide the address, decide the topology, decide all the other details uh, that in the more traditional networks uh, need to be specified by hand or by somebody who does the configuration. So again, it's a different thing. It's not just uh, the consequence of, of going wireless changes a lot of assumptions behind. It, makes, it needs to make everything much simpler, more automated, and so on. This is about the, the network. If you go on the other side, and of course we don't have time to, to, to go deep into that, uh, it's simpler. Uh, I, I found less, uh, less variables because many of them, uh, many of the specificity of the devices depend on the network to which they are connected. So in some way, you cannot take, of course, a device on one network connected to, to another. But uh, even devices uh, on the same network may have different characteristics. Some are dependent on the network, some are dependent on the specific nature of the device. Hmm. Um, I would just open one of these because we mentioned that earlier, so I don't want to keep the, the, the issue open until next week or later, I don't remember which next time we can continue. Uh, about uh, power in the device. You remember there was a, uh, a question at the beginning about power over Ethernet. So uh, one of the, here we said how the devices uh, exchange data. And so this is a characteristic of the network. All the devices in a network must exchange data in the same way. But then each individual device needs to be powered in some way, and this device may do it in different ways. Some of them are powered devices, so devices that in some way get power supply, get energy from a power line, from a power supply line. And this supply may come from the mains, from the AC distribution in your house, in many cases, through a transformer to lower the, the, the voltage and, uh, and uh, make it continuous, um, but it depends on the cases. Or may get 
power from the bus. In the case where you have a wired connection, and this wired connection is able to deliver you some energy also. This is the case for all the smart home buses, my open connects and so on. These are buses, a twisted pairs of wires, but these wires are, have a, a power supply, a DC power supply that keeps attention on the bus. And this, uh, this voltage is able to feed all the different devices. And depending, of course, the number of devices that you have, each of them will suck some milliampers and uh, you need to have a, a, a power supply with sufficient size or more than one power supply, you need to split the line, you need to split the topology in order to give power to all the devices. Or, uh, for example, power over Ethernet, it's another solution of this kind where the bus in this case is the Ethernet connection, if you have, and you can use uh, uh, the, the Ethernet cable to, to power the device itself. So it's actually the, the, the symmetrical, um, uh, situation. Uh, actually, most of what we call the wired networks uh, for the mm, smart home protocols, uh, they always get uh, power from the mains. Hmm? The only one that doesn't get power is uh, Modbus, for example, which is a, use a serial line which doesn't allow uh, power. Is there a question? Yes. Uh, which device could be power supplied Uh, well, it depends. Uh, um, you may have uh, some devices that are specifically designed for power over Ethernet. So, uh, for example, uh, you have environmental cameras or sensors, something like that, in which you just need a cable, you have a camera in a corner, you, need to, you just need to bring the Ethernet cable there. You need to have a switch, a power over Ethernet switch and cable. The, but you can just have uh, one, one, uh, the normal Ethernet infrastructure, and then you have one switch, which is uh, POA uh, enabled, the cable, and then the devices. Mm, the, the first that came to my mind are, are cameras. So um, the other possibility is there are some adapters that uh, uh, receive the uh, um, uh, POE cable and have uh, on the other side uh, a short uh, Ethernet cable and the 5 volt, for example, USB connector plug. And so you can power other devices that are meant to be uh, fed with the normal uh, power supplies. But that's the, that's a, the issue of what is the tension, what is the amperes, and uh, so it, it's more difficult to find them. Um, of course, you cannot power too, much, too, too many watts. Um, battery operated devices. Battery operated devices are, of course, devices that have a power supply on board, which is in the form of a battery. There may be a rechargeable battery or a disposable battery. Uh, in both cases, uh, you need, of course, to have a maintenance cycle in which you charge or um, replace the batteries. And the device must have very strong uh, power management uh, capabilities. Must be able to consume as little power as possible because that will change uh, all the maintenance cost of the device itself. It's not just the cost of energy in that case. Okay? And uh, usually these kind of devices uh, tend to be sleeping at all time, at most time. In most time they are, they switch off. Uh, this of course applies to wireless uh, because if you're a wire you can get power also. But if you don't have a wire that goes there, you have only a battery. And uh, what, what does consume most power in a, in a Z-Wave device? The radio section, the radio section. So you switch off the radio. Maybe the CPU is still running, the memory is there, is supplied, consumes so, much, so, 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 so few. But the radio is switched off most of the time. So the device is working if it's a sensor with measures temperatures, measures uh, whatever it's, it's going to measure, but it just doesn't communicate because communicating is very costly from the energy standpoint. And so it switches the radio on only when it has something to say or periodically just to check, uh, to say that it's alive and to check whether there's any comments for it. So this is it's a, 
it's a special mode that many devices have and we'll, we'll come to that. And uh, just 30 seconds just to, to mention this and very interesting, with, I hope uh, we can talk about this, uh, uh, about this technology. There are some technologies that are so-called energy harvesting. So they don't need any power supply, they get energy from the environment. So there is one technology that is called Inocean that has been designed specifically for this purpose. The protocol, everything, the chipset, very low power, and the protocol expects for a long disconnection. So devices that usually are died, are dead, sorry. Not just sleeping, just <laughs> really dead, don't do anything, they are not powered, except for very short periods of time. For example, uh, I saw some, some buttons, okay, so for switching the lights on, in which the energy of the human pushing the button is enough to create some milliwatt hours, some joules, some joules, just to power the device, <laughs> or switch on the radio, send a command, and then die. But the, you, you have, when you are pushing something, you are con contrasting a spring force. Okay, spring time distance is, is, uh, is energy. And so you get this energy to uh, operate the device. It's very nice. Some uh, sensors, temperature sensor, which have a very, very tiny solar panel. They need just to send one message every half an hour, so they don't need the, the big panels or so no. Something that works on, um, um, on heaters, so the valves, uh, the common heaters, uh, that take energy directly from the uh, temperature differential between the heater, which is hot, and the ambient. And so they can get, it's not very you know, uh, efficient from a thermodynamic point of view, but it's enough. When you have some millijoules, you can do already some computing. Right? So it's a very interesting technology. I, I hope we can present it later. Okay, but for today, it's enough. You can, if you, you can start picking, of course, at this, uh, other classification uh, items, but uh, we'll uh, see them together next time. Thank you.